to our new webinar today. Uh, we have uh, the chance to have uh, with us two eminent uh, speakers to um, expose the uh, new position paper uh, published by the European Chamber of Commerce in China. Uh, each year, as you know, uh, a position paper is published and uh, uh, is awaited with uh, uh, impatience by all the European business community, but also by the Chinese community, business community uh, in Europe, and by the uh, Chinese and European authorities. We have the chance to uh, have a presentation of this position paper. Of course, if you want to get uh, all the text, you are free to contact the European uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, in uh, China, where uh, you will find it uh, available uh, through uh, them. Uh, let me introduce uh, our two uh, speakers. Uh, first of all, I will have it. I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Adam Dunnett. Mr. Dunnett uh, is the Secretary General of the European Chamber of Commerce in uh, China. Uh, he has a, a career that has focused on trade and investment promotion, uh, on advocacy and association management. Uh, as uh, the Secretary General of the European Chamber, he's responsible for the overall implementation of its objectives, visibility, membership, and advocacy activities across its seven chapters and nine offices in China. I uh, remind you that the European Chamber is present in Beijing, but also in Chengdu, in Chongqing, in Guangzhou, in Nanjing, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, in Shenyang, and in Tianjin. Um, Adam first joined the European Chamber in 2006. He served first as the senior business manager, later as a Beijing general manager, and since uh, 2013 as the secretary general. Previously, he worked uh, as a commercial officer at the Canadian Embassy in Beijing um, and uh, in a consulting firm uh, as a deputy managing director. Uh, since 2012, he serves as a board member and a rotating chair of the EU SME Center. So uh, we have the chance uh, to have a great specialist of uh, Chinese uh, business life and Chinese uh, economy with us. And uh, together with him uh, is uh, our compatriot, Mr. Antoine Brunel. Uh, Mr. Brunel uh, is the general manager of Luanzhou International Circuit, and he will tell us uh, more about uh, this. Uh, he's also a commercial and marketing director of a racing team, the Phantom Global uh, Racing. Uh, and uh, he's here also in his capacity of national representative of Belgium uh, within the board of the European Chamber of Commerce in China. Uh, he's member of the supervisory board of uh, the chamber. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear speakers, I leave you the uh, floor. Mr. Donet, you have the word. Okay, great. Uh, I'll, I'll start off then. Th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dewitt. Pleasure to speak to everybody here uh, again. I think, uh, hopefully I can control the slides uh, or I need to tell somebody. I, I I think I've lost control of the slides on our side here now. Yeah. Uh, while it's being fixed, maybe Antoine can tell you a little bit more about yeah. Phantom Ray. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Antoine Brunel. Um, as uh, Mr. DeWitt mentioned, uh, I'm the state representative uh, for Belgium at the uh, European Chamber of Commerce. I've been in China for uh, now 20 years um, and doing business in China for 20 years. I've been leading this project as a commercial real estate project, uh, which includes uh, a racetrack uh, in northern China. It's a 2 billion RMB project where we are building uh, you know, from uh, land acquisition to construction and then operation of a commercial real estate product, which is linked to motorsports. And on, on top of uh, uh, my position as a general manager of the project, I'm also uh, involved in a, in a race team, an international race team, where I travel all over the world uh, to attend races and, and promote our, our newly uh, founded race team, which is uh, um, the largest in, in Asia. Great. Thank you. 
So very difficult to follow that with, <laughs> <laughs> with the position paper uh, debriefing, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best here. So I, it looks like the slides aren't back up here, but I'll, I'll start maybe some IT. Can uh, help apparently, here. you need to share with us. We have no control on your slides. Okay, I was sharing, but it's been taken off. Anyways, I'll start. My IT colleague is coming, uh, and I'll just start. So, uh, la oh. ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, our position paper, we, we, this is our annual flagship publication. We have a business confidence survey that I've presented to you before, which gives you a quantitative look at how businesses are operating and what their outlook is for the market. Our, our annual position paper is based on the uh, feedback over a, a six-month process from our working groups. We have over 50 working groups in the chamber that cover everything from banking to agriculture to, to legal to construction to, to energy, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and in the process of um, collecting their feedback, we ask all of them every year to write a position paper, uh, and it's uh, based on their concern, uh, their assessment, and recommendations that they have uh, to improve the business environment here. Can you put the slides up? Um, uh, and so uh, in putting together all of these different um, uh, uh, papers over the last year and trying to synthesize it into an executive summary that we present every year um, to our to our members, um, uh, we have to take all of that into consideration to come up with what, with, with what is our 50-page executive summary. This document that I'm going to go through uh, briefly with you now is available to download for free uh, from our website. Uh, so can you all see the slides now? They can see the slides, but they can't hear us now. Sure. We uh, can hear you. you can hear me. And you can see the slides, is that right? Yes, yes we can, can see the slide, it's perfect. Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, just, just for a bit of context, let's go back. You know, it hasn't even been two years since the lockdown measures on COVID have been removed um, from China. That happened uh, in, in December, early January, um, uh, nearly two years ago. Uh, and since that time, I think all of you know that the economy has been relatively sluggish, relatively sluggish being, you know, four or five percent, which is pretty good in terms of European and Chinese terms, but certainly a lot lower than what we, we are used to here. And certainly the feeling from business is that it's not even it's not even at that level. Um, and so we've all been waiting for this rebound for for the last um, uh, two years. We ha we haven't seen it happen yet. You've all probably seen the stimulus package that was announced um, uh, just a few weeks ago. But even with that, it, it hasn't really kickstarted things yet. And all, all of this to say is, um, you know, companies in the past year, European companies, many companies have done well. Many companies have done extremely well, but they've done well against, you know, many different challenges that that they face here just in this market, whether it's regulatory or political or, or market access. Um, and so the rewards that many of them did reap in the past were justified by the challenges that they faced. And they thought, okay, well, you know, I can put up with this because my rewards, my growth is, is so significant. Um, that's no longer the case with the slowing economy uh, and the slower uh, margins that they're making and slower profitability, uh, again, with the slower economy has made it much less compelling for companies to justify, particularly in this geopolitical environment, to their headquarters, why they should be continuing to invest more. Um, and so our, our our plea to the Chinese government, and they're as much concerned about the economy as, as we are, is that they that they don't need more stimulus. They don't they can't afford more economic stimulus. What they need to do is take a more uh, proactive approach to reforming and making better use of, of market forces of the private sector to stimulate the innovation that they're calling for in all of their recent plans. And so our position paper with a thousand recommendations is a very detailed granular look at just about every sector, 50 different sectors that we have that basically give them sort of a, a pathway on how we think they can do it. So we're, we're calling on the government not for more action plans, but for more action. And specifically, that can be done through our uh, mammoth position paper of nearly 500 pages. So yeah, background to the to the mounting challenges. Let's just go through this uh, quickly here. There are the long-standing challenges that persist, and I would say it's not just long-standing challenges that persist, but that have deepened. First one here, 
market access and regulatory barriers. We've been talking about these issues for a long time, since the start of the chamber 20 years ago, market access has been a key issue for us. And, and to be fair, there have been improvements in market access, but as, as you know from our chamber messaging, it's often too little, too late. They've removed joint venture requirements back in 2017, uh, and um, uh, they've reduced the, the negative list, but for most companies, they dare not enter the market now. If you're in the banking sector, I mean, you've got 1% of the market, you can't afford to buy a, a, a Chinese bank. And most sectors in China here are suffering from um, um, overcapacity in any case. Uh, coal, cement, uh, apparel, um, uh, shipping, um, uh, pork, uh, dairy we were just talking about, and perhaps one you might want to comment on is e-vehicles. Yes, uh, same, uh, same, same as well. Actually, there's been actually pessimism actually in, in the entire industry. Uh, I think it's not only our European companies, actually, it's also Chinese companies. Uh, there's a lot of pessimism about the future, and actually it's, it's been impacting a lot of, a lot of our members uh, at the European Chamber, but also at the, at the, at the Benelux Chamber. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and then all of this, and this is, I'm just going through the topics of longstanding and, and persistent challenges, but, but they're becoming more ingrained. I mean, the other example is the highly politicized business environment. I mean, you know what the environment there is back in Europe, but I, I get delegations and visitors coming here and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very depressing. Um, uh, and then, the, you know, another contributor to this um, uh, and a contributor to the increased regulatory barriers is the prioritization of national security uh, and the advancement of, of, of self-reliance. You can call it dual circulation. You can call it uh, autonomous innovation. You can call it um, uh, secure and controllable. All sorts of different language that you've heard of uh, over the last few years coming up in a, a number of a uh, slew of, of, of laws and regulations, uh, which are forcing companies to, to really um, review their supply chains and their compliance obligations, and it, it's just becoming a bigger headache. So these are longstanding issues that have become even more ingrained. And then we have the new challenges. As I was saying earlier, China, China's economic slowdown, in, in the past, we could justify it because the rewards and profitability and growth were all there. That's not the case when you've got overcapacity and people are selling below cost and you don't see the growth. And um, quite, quite frankly, you're, you're, you're dealing with local competitors that have access to, to, to subsidies and preferential treatment and, and SOEs and the like. And for a lot of companies, it's just really hard to, to, to make that extra dollar and to justify additional investment um, as, a, as a result. And um, as we saw from the uh, uh, third, third plenum and from the Lianghui earlier this year as is, is, is well. The Chinese answer for this is either more stimulus and it's stimulus going into more manufacturing. I think you've all heard of the concept of new quality productive forces. That's just another type of language to, to, to talk about the, the uh, promoting uh, the manufacturing sector. We've got so too much manufacturing we've got not enough consumption it's well recognized that com consumption needs to be boosted but the chinese economic model and the approach is one that's always been heavily focused on manufacturing and very reluctant to to promote consumption through through other more uh, traditional conservative means of building safety nets to to to, to, to spur confidence and all that um, that's a, that's one of the solutions that we're, we're promoting, but we don't see any shift or change in in, in the current approach. It, it's 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 growth. It, it's 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 the the approach from the the, the government work report from earlier this year is it, is growth through stability and stability through using the same sort of mechanism and tools that they've used in the past, would have, which have served them well in the last 20, 30 years. But we don't think it's it's a sustainable solution. Uh, going forward. So again, the, the, the conclusion or the, the sort of elevator pitch is the risks are beginning to outweigh the rewards and it's a tipping point for, for businesses here. And this is actually, you can actually see this in the, in the result of the survey because uh, now you can actually uh, see from our companies, our member companies, uh, uh, when they are surveyed, uh, they're actually very pessimistic about the future. So when you look at um, at this question, how how is your industry uh, how is your industry business environment changed over the years? Is the past three years uh, we have seen consecutive record high? So if you look at the past ten years of this survey, uh, never it happened three years in a row that you have progressive you know uh, uh, pessimism. Uh, so there's more and more difficulties 
Uh, I think, as uh, Adam mentioned earlier, I think the fact that uh, Chinese companies are also uh, struggling themselves, so it become uh, also harder now for for Europe companies, uh, European companies. Um, well, when we thought we would see, you know, an improvement, uh, if you see on the graph from 2021, we thought we would see an improvement after the COVID, uh, but that that gap, you know, that that uh, that jump that everyone was expecting has not happened, uh, and actually worsened, if if anything. Um, so this actually lead to uh, the next uh, the next slide. Uh, and the pessimism about uh, about the profitability. Yeah. So there's uh, less and less profitability for those companies. Um, so 71% uh, report that their worldwide uh, uh, profits is actually worse in China than worldwide. So that leads to a question on why invest more in China when there is more profitability elsewhere and less profit uh, more profitability, but also a lot less uh troubles, I would say, than, than in China, because uh, China has a lot of regulatory issue, a lot of competi competitive, you know, with uh, competition with uh, local companies, which are, you know, unfairly uh, helped. Um, so all this actually in tandem, if you look at the, both, uh, both data, it's actually not uh, very looking very good for, for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how is this impacting uh, current and future investments uh, as, as a result? Um, obviously, people are going to be much more skeptical and, and cautious about in, investing. There's a number of metrics you can use to, to measure investment. Uh, this one happens to be from, from UNCTAD, from, from the UN, but China has its own measures, uh, MOFCOM, State Administration of Foreign Exchange, they all have their own measures. Um, but all of them consistently show um, uh, downward trends. I think this year, um, in the last quarter, the Rhodium Group actually showed that there was a there was there was some pickup. But the trend is 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 very clear. And what's interesting is the type of investment that that is coming in is one. It's mainly coming from multinationals. It's coming uh, less and less from from SMEs and smaller players that just uh, find it too challenging. Although we do have an SME center, as uh, Mr. Duet mentioned earlier, we are trying to help them. And there are there are examples where SMEs can and still are doing well here. But for the majority of of the big investment that's coming, what's interesting, it's no longer about. Um, expanding and trying to grow the market. It's it's about trying to uh, build a defensive nature to uh, protect the investment and the markets that you already have. It's, it's very defensive in nature. So it's about um, onshoring supply chains so you're not caught, you know, um, if there's a new regulation that comes out that requires you to have made in China uh, components, or if you're exporting um, so that you're, you know, um, you're able to export to markets where you know that uh, made in China products will be fully uh, accepted. Um, uh, and then, of course, even just selling within the Chinese market, there's more and more requirements for companies to either use uh, 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 IP that's registered here uh, in China uh, to, to, to hand over um, uh, algorithms or to be able to um, uh, meet certain other uh, compliance and security regulations, which, you know, some of the companies, some big European investors have told me that some of their technology, they're not comfortable uh, either handing it over or providing more security related um, information that's being required for them to um, uh, use and, and source uh, their product here in China. Uh, and as a result, their their competitive edge is is less uh, is less than a, what could have been. And if that's the case, then you know what's the compelling reason for them to be doing business here if they're just going to be able to provide the same type of product that any other Chinese uh, manufacturer would be able to do. Um, yeah. Uh, and so uh, companies are changing their approaches to the market. Um, uh, approximately 18% uh, of our members are have decided that they will continue to onshore their supply chain here, again, because the Chinese market is extremely important, uh, because longer-term companies do believe that the market will be here. Not sure if they will be here, but the market will certainly be here, and they want to hold on for as long as they possibly can. But for others, which use this place as a, an export basis in the past or, or because of requirements elsewhere, 12% are actually moving their supply chains overseas. So we're seeing a, a fundamental restructuring of, of the economy here. Um, it's not it's not the majority, but it's a significant minority, and this is happening over time. So I think it really deserves our attention. This chart in front of you here is, is an interesting one because it talks about um, uh, companies and um, uh, their their approach to China 
and let me sort of let's move to my slide here. It talks to um, uh, decoupling. Thank you, decoupling with the, with their headquarters here. And if you look at the slide, forty one percent have seen decoupling in in the last uh, in the last year. This is not just about supply chain. This is also about um, operations, and it's about people and staff. And our next report in the chamber is going to be on siloing. And a big part of siloing is we're seeing a siloing of operations and human resources. With increased localization, with less visits coming here to, to China, with more um, uh, meetings, securitized meetings about what's being shared and what's not, we're seeing a real uh, un unfortunate situation of less sharing of information um, and less connectivity between European headquarters and their local operations here in China. So we, we really want to call out to European executives to continue to come to China to see for themselves what's going on, to reconnect with their with their staff locally, and, and likewise for, for Chinese managers and executives based here in, 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 in China, for them to go back to headquarters, to report to them, to have those face-to-face -face meetings, uh, to reduce uh, this... Um, uh, this decoupling from a, from an operational perspective. I know that's not a popular word to use, but these are things that we're seeing and we, we, we're calling them out. So what can be done? Um, uh, uh, action can turn the tide, plans announced, but full impl implementation needed. So let's go back historically. Uh, I'm going to give you four, four moments in time in the last uh, 20, 40 years to think about. In green, in the top left-hand corner here, you can see the early... 2000s when China joined the WTO, December December 11th, 2001. I was sitting in a in a in my office just down the street from here and thinking, boy, this is an incredible moment. You know what will what will China be like in 20 years time? Never thought I'd be here today <laughs> giving a presentation like this. Um, but the five year WTO implementation period went relatively well, uh, and the chamber uh, recognized it and called it out and and said this was a successful period. And I think our members in the West generally expected this to continue, this level of, um, of, of reform and opening and market-based approaches to, to the economy would continue following the WTO. We didn't really see it. Although the economy grew uh, at incredible speeds, although the companies did extremely well, we didn't see much reform happening in the period from 2000, 2006 to 2013. And we thought all of that changed when in 2013, the Communist Party of China has its uh, national uh, congress uh, uh, every, every five years, is a, there's a new um, uh, party congress. And in the third plenum of the 2013 uh, 18th party congress, um, the economic reforms for the five years ahead are normally announced. And in that, we saw this amazing language about how the uh, market would continue to play or would play uh, a decisive role in the economy. And quite frankly, we didn't see that playing out in the years that followed. Instead, we saw the language of bigger, better, stronger SOEs continued uh, to be doubled down on. And, and so we spent the last 10 years quite, you know, quite frankly, in despair, hoping that, you know, there would be uh, uh, a turn towards more of a market private sector focus. But instead, um, our, our experience was that um, more focus was given towards the, the state sector and more towards security. Um, there was a subsequent moment in 2017, Davos, when uh, President Xi Jinping uh, went to, to Davos and made this, uh, made this amazing speech about continuing market in an opening. And indeed, in that year, there were a number of uh, improvements in, in market access and in reduction in, in, in tariffs. But for most of our member companies, most of them didn't really act upon it. Certainly not, certainly in terms of investment, only two major investments followed that. Most other companies we spoke with and most of our survey results subsequent to 2017 show that despite that there was more market opening, more opportunities for companies to invest as wholly foreign-owned enterprises, the vast majority chose to continue to not only work with joint ventures, but to double down and take in greater mar market share uh, and, and, and taking great, greater equity within their operations, um, opening and inviting SOEs to join because they really realize it's easier to grow with SOEs than it is to compete against them. I mean, the, the facts are there. It's, um, it's a very practical approach. So that was, that was the challenges we faced uh, uh, immediately after 2017 and the results that we saw. Fast forward, as you see, every five years, um, a, a new uh, party, a uh, new national congress of, of, of the CPC, and a new third plenum comes out, um, uh, came out earlier this year. But prior prior to that, in, in, in June, July of this year, we had an announcement from the State Council 
and the Ministry of Commerce on the 13th of August 2023 with this document called the Opinions, the Opinions uh, on Creating a Better Business Environment. It was a fantastic document um, detailing in uh, in 24 macro ways and 59 sub-measures of how they were going to improve the, the business environment. I'm happy to share this document with you, with your, with your audience here. And, and this became our priority. For the last 12 months, we said, we're going to monitor this document. We're going to talk to our members. And this is the focus of getting to the core and the meat of our executive position paper for this year. And we focused on two things. The first was, what has happened with these 24 measures or 59 sub-measures in the last 12 months since they, they said that this was the, the, the guiding direction for, for the foreign business uh, in, environment? What we did is we, we went to every single one of our working groups and we um, asked them to evaluate these 24 measures. We gave them a different a star and rating. It's in, it's in the executive summary. You, you can see it. We gave them one for implement. We gave them one rating for implementation. We gave them one rating for um, uh, for potential impact, i.e. impact if it was fully fully implemented. And broadly speaking, although there were a number of areas where we saw uh, implementation to varying degrees, um, most of it um, was either of limited impact um, as a result, or in the few areas where we did see it uh, fully implemented, the impact was was naturally very limited to begin with because of the scope. So let me go let me go through some of these uh, examples. So uh, what we did do, I'll, I'm pointing to, to bullet two here, is we took the 59 submeasures and we we recategorized them in 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 importance to the chamber what we thought would be most important to, to our members. So we broke them down into market access and procurement, HR and business travel, digital and cyber, green energy access, IPR, investment promotion. So I will quickly go through each one of these um, subcategories that we viewed as you know um, of most interest to the chamber. So the first one on market access and procurement, um, uh, as you saw from, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, we, we did see some market opening in a number of areas, but they were off, often either very limited in scope or uh, very limited to certain geographies in China. So we've highlighted that in the IT sector for, for sure, uh, in terms of value um, added telecom services, there's been opening. In the maritime sector, for example, the Shanghai Cargo Relay Pilot actually was already announced um, two years earlier, but we, we threw that in there as well. Um, they've opened that up, but it's limited to just three cities um, in, in, in China. Um, there's lots of lots of strong wording on, on procurement. The big ticket items for us, the biggest issue in the last year has been access to, to public um, and uh, government procurement. Uh, lots of strong language in these measures um, about equal and level uh, treatment when it comes to government procurement. A lot of meetings from the from the, from uh, the Chinese government on this topic. But I'll be very honest with you. When I go and ask our measures, uh, when I go and ask our members before going into meetings, I I ask them. I say, has the situation improved or has it not? And I will tell you, we are no better off. I would say we are worse off today than we were a year ago. And I think a large part of that is being driven by um, a lot of the security measures where companies, including even European and foreign companies here in China that have to uh, procure um, uh, uh, for their own uh, supply uh, and, and um, business operations, even our own members will prefer sometimes to buy from Chinese because they just feel it's easier um, to, to be compliant with relevant rules and regulations in, in doing so. Uh, nobody in this environment here now wants to be uh, on the wrong side of, of the law. Um, and, and so compliance has become uh, a real um, a way of undermining business confidence if they're not getting the, the clarity uh, that they need um, in their business operations. Um, the second area that I mentioned was uh, HR and business travel. Lots of language in these measures about um, uh, facilitating visas and uh, making it more convenient to do uh, for big people to travel here. I will say in this regard, they actually have done a lot. A lot of you are aware of the new uh, visa free policy. You can come for 15 days. So it's great for tourists. It's great for a business visitor coming for 15 days. Um, but it, it, it hasn't been enough to really bring the expats that need to be working and based here. In fact, if I have another call um, uh, to your to your members, Mr. Duet, I would encourage them to try and send more um, European executives 
to work here in China so that we can bridge this gap, as I was talking about earlier. The other area where China actually did uh, do a lot, um, but this wasn't anything new, it was an extension of the IIT, the Individual Income Tax um, Extension. That took place uh, uh, nearly two years ago as well. So that was that was welcome. And these are areas <clears throat> where China, where when it comes to the implementation of these 24 measures, it itself will say, these are the areas that we've done it. This is a good example of how we're, we're fulfilling these measures. But for us, this isn't, this quite, this quite frankly, isn't, isn't enough to turn the tide and, and to attract more foreign investment as well. That has to be the ultimate indicator. The third category here, digital in cyber. In addition to procurement, <clears throat> the other major issue for us in the last year has been about uh, cross-border data transfer issues. Data is very sensitive, data being the new, the new oil. Um, uh, clarity on what is considered to be sensitive information, uh, what is considered to be important data is, is really important for companies. And going back to the compliance thing, if they can't get approvals for the <clears throat> export of their data, then they fear they're running afoul of the law and they dare not to do it. And it's this sort of data which they can share with their headquarters that allows them to innovate, that allows them to do clinical trials, that allows them to use big data to develop new technolo new technologies and new innovations that they can bring back to the Chinese market. Again, that can be in line with China's goal of new quality productive forces. But in, in a large way, we feel that, you know, they're being handcuffed or China is handcuff handcuffing itself because on the one hand, it's calling for all of this innovation. But at the same time, if it makes the regulatory environment um, too, too challenging or not clear enough, then companies obviously aren't going to take those risks. Number four is green energy. This actually isn't covered particularly well in the 24 measures. Uh, we were consulted before the 24 measures were produced, so we're, we're, we're grateful for that. But um, uh, amazingly, 42% of our members report limited access to green energy here in China. I, I, I try to impress upon the Chinese government that if you want to attract uh, more foreign investment, companies need to be assured that they can get access to green electricity. They've got their carbon neutrality goals to, to, to meet in, in, in Europe. Uh, and China, surprisingly, being a country which is a major exporter of, uh, of, of, uh, of renewable energy, power source, solar and, and wind and all that, uh, surprisingly is not able to meet the own demand for its companies uh, here um, in China. And European companies often find that they are being placed second on the wait list to SOEs that have similar goals uh, as well. I think you wanted to mention something on access to green electricity as well that, that you were telling me. Yeah, when uh, when we actually uh, were presented the, uh, the the same report uh, from one of our other member who is actually working in the green energy, he was actually mentioning that uh, the European uh, I mean the Chinese market in the last eighteen months has invested uh, so much in the green energy that it's matching the entire uh, European uh, green energy in the last eighteen months. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a huge, huge uh, production of uh, of uh, green energy, uh, but it's not it's not in the right region. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, as uh, Adam has mentioned, uh, the priority is given to uh, state-owned companies uh, to have access to this green energy and mm -hmm. and for them to meet their own goals. Um, yeah, and nuclear is only representing five or six percent of the total uh, total energy uh, in China. Uh, so sixty percent uh, of energy is still produce, uh, still coming from uh, coal, uh, which is now helping uh, this goal this this goal of green energy. Uh, so although China is the the largest uh, producer of uh, of this you know technologies, is still uh, a lot a long way before it can apply it to to his own country. Yeah. And of course, this is also one area where Europe and China should be able to cooperate together. I mean, a lot of big French nuclear companies that have traditionally been uh, involved in the industry here, uh, I've seen gradually sort of pushed out and and, and their involvement uh, reduced. But, and then for other areas, uh, a lot of European service providers, construction industry, um, uh, I mean, we've got so much experience in, in Europe. And um, yeah, just I'd, I'd really like to see more of them uh, participating in in the in the green transition. So uh, we we run a lot of conferences here um, uh, in China in our different chapters, uh, trying to promote uh, cooperation on on the green energy transition here. And this is one area where we we think China needs to um, apply it more domestically uh, as well. 
Uh, I think the uh, fourth or fifth yeah. category here was intellectual property rights. Uh, this is an issue, you know, that's uh, 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 <laughs> it's been here forever. Um, but it's funny because again, these twenty-four measures, the document, it's a really impressive document. I mean, we uh, we warmly welcomed it, and we said, you know, if you go ahead and implement this document as it's laid out. We're very confident that you'll be able to change, you know, the business environment here. But our own business confidence survey, we, we ask this question every single year. You know, what do you think of the, of the laws and regulations? Okay, 84% say that they are uh, ad adequate to excellent. Okay, and that's improved over the years. But despite the fact that the, the 24 measures uh, have put this additional focus on the protection of IPR, I can tell you two things. One... Uh, the the num the percentage of our members that believe that they are not adequately enforced instead of going down actually went up by one percentage point and i myself this year have written more letters on ipr cases for our companies and industry than i probably have in any year before um so uh it's a very uh still challenging environment for for intellectual uh, property um our, our president has has made the comment that you know even in china there's different, obviously, the uh, e-platform, e uh, um, e-commerce uh, uh, e industry is, is has hugely developed here in China. But we all know, foreigners and children alike, know that if you want to buy the real product, you go to platform A. And if you want to buy the cheaper product, which is probably a knockoff, you go to platform B. And and the fact that even kids know where you where you get the real stuff and the fake stuff is, is I think a, a pretty strong example that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and could be easily done if you could um, oblige these uh, e-commerce platforms to be more respectful of intellectual property rights. Um, uh, this is the yeah this is the last one as, as I said we categorize these into six sectors um, the uh, last sector is investment promotion and facilitation. Uh, the 20, these 24 measures, you know, China uh, has actually done a great job. Uh, there's more conferences to go to than ever before. We get more invites. We get better treatment. We, we uh, lots of requests to, to come and invest in, in different provinces and cities uh, in meetings and all that. Um, but quite, quite frankly, it's uh, what companies need, as like I said earlier, it's not just more um, action plans, but it's actual action. They need to see that there's a compelling uh, business opportunity uh, and economic incentive to make that investment. It's not simply, um, you know, uh, words and, and speeches that will do it. Uh, and it goes back to the points I was making earlier about um, uh, just the lack of predictability. If you look at, you know, trade cases going from e-vehicles to, to brandy to, to pork, I mean, that you think you're safe in one sector and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, you get hit because of what somebody else has done in another sector. Those sorts of stories, um, they have a real impact on on, on companies that are um, uh, that are very nervous at this time. Uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, for for a lot of uh, the general guidelines, it's a broad sort of statement. But there's often a need for more detailed sort of guidance as to what this actually means uh, in practice. So uh, very much looking forward to companies, so provinces, rolling out these guidelines. There's 24 measures at a provincial and at a municipal level as well. But it needs to be more than just a cut and paste job from what the central authorities are doing. It needs to go further. It needs to say how it's going to be applied specifically uh, to individual cities. And each and every individual city in China should try to leverage its competitive and comparative advantage to uh, to, to attract companies as a result. So as I... Uh, as the focus of the, uh, of this year's executive position paper, it was a review of the 24 measures and the six categories that I mentioned, and you can go through the executive summary to get a point-by-point -point breakdown of it. The other focus of, of our position paper uh, this year was to review the third plenum decision. As I mentioned, um, the Communist Party of China uh, has uh, a new uh, central committee every five years. Uh, every year there's a, a, a plenary session. The, the third plenary session is considered as the one that sort of sets forward the direction for the uh, economy in the years to come. So this year's third plenum uh, in, uh, in June, July this year was uh, and was highly anticipated by, by our members, but there was no significant uh, changes in direction from our perspective, um, no 
Um, uh, no major surprise. There was a new chapter, I think, on security. Uh, there was a continued focus on new quality productive forces, i.e. manufacturing, as I, as I mentioned as well. And then this whole, this whole wording from the 2013 decision that I mentioned earlier, the decisive role of, of the market in the economy, well, they've changed it now. It's now the decisive role in resource allocation. That's the role of the market now, but it still has very similar language on the role of SOEs, which is for them to become stronger, better, and bigger. Um, so that, um, uh, that, that paradox between the two, is it going to be the public sector or the private sector? We'll see that battle continue to play out. Um, uh, we'll fight for the, for the private sector uh, as we do, but I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be tough. Uh, so, um, in terms of summary re remarks, despite you know the the level, despite all the sort of pessimism that Antoine and, and myself may have sort of indicated here right now to you, I, I do want to say that um, our members, uh, you know, I, I was with an executive today at lunch, and and he said, you know, I'm not concerned about the next five or ten years. He's still optimistic about the next five. He said, I'm more concerned about the next six months. I just don't know what's going to happen. And that's a frequent conversation I have in, in, in board meetings as well, is people are CEOs. It's really hard to understand what's going to happen in the next six to, to 12 months. So we're, we're crossing the river by feeling the stones, uh, as they say. But broadly speaking, believe it or not, we still have confidence in, in the economy. We hope um, that our share and our involvement will, will, will improve. Um, we remain concerned about all the areas of procurement, uh, use of data, um, security related measures, some of which again are not unique to, 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 to China. But we did we do want to highlight that we do see this as a tipping point because if if the market isn't there because it's saturated because of overcapacity, because of lower demand, um, uh, then it's going to become much more difficult for companies to to reap those profits and to justify future and continued uh, investments as as a result. So um, we really strongly uh, urge the, uh, the Chinese government to look at our uh, position paper uh, as uh, as an objective sort of analysis of what can be doing at, at a sectoral level. We mean it with the best of intentions. We try to keep it constructive and focused on on a number of areas. Um, and again, uh, it's not it's not uh, stimulus packages that we need, um, uh, and it's not more investment in, in manufacturing and overcapacity. It, it's really about making a shift in the economy to a, a private sector, consumer driven one, uh, and that's what we we continue to to advocate for. So I, I'll stop there, and um, yeah, I'll hand over back to Mr. Dewitt, unless uh, Antoine you want to make, make any other comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunnett. I don't know if uh, uh, Mr. Brunel wants to add uh, some uh, comment. No? I think I, I okay. uh, did uh, very well in the presentation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, it was uh, really uh, uh, interesting to, to listen to you. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, um, well, uh, the, the, the risks are beginning to outweigh the, the rewards. Uh, the situation uh, uh, is likely uh, to deteriorate and with a slowing economy. Uh, you mentioned that there are 1,000 recommendations made by the position, uh, by the, the, the chamber in its position paper. And of course, we suggest strongly uh, to our listeners to uh, look and read uh, this uh, important paper um, with its executive summary, but also uh, with the main, uh, uh, the main course, the main uh, um, book. Um, the challenges, the challenges are mounting. Um, Long-standing challenges persist, did you say, uh, with market access and regulatory barriers, with politicized business environment, with pessimism, pessimism about uh, future, with prioritization of national security and advancing self-reliance. There are new challenges that have emerged, uh, like uh, the China's economic slowdown, like the uh, uh, the less domestic consumption uh, and overcapacity. And uh, you, you mentioned uh, figures uh, in uh, your surveys. You have uh, 
also uh, details that cha that companies european companies have begun adjusting uh, their approach to china market um uh, some uh, start uh, shifting investments planned for china to alternative uh, markets um you have noticed an increase of decoupling uh, between the headquarters and the China operations, bringing the risk of reduced engagement and missed opportunities. Um, you uh, say that uh, uh, action action can turn uh, the, the tide, uh, and that is uh, the important role your chamber is uh, playing, and uh, I would say uh, uh, the, the various uh, uh, national chambers uh, in Europe uh, are also trying to, to push in that sense. Uh, you have uh, uh, noticed uh, that uh, the, uh, there are several dates uh, important, uh, 2013, uh, with an important uh, reform plans, but with limited implementation, 2017 with the important speech of President Xi Jinping in Davos, uh, where uh, he expressed the commitment of China to market reform, but with a mixed implementation. Uh, and uh, you have um, uh, studied uh, carefully the uh, opinions uh, document uh, of uh, 13 of August of last year, um, opinions for better business environment, and the uh, purpose was to um, check uh, clearly what uh, has been uh, uh, done uh, and uh, what has been done on the ground um, with uh, uh, several chapters, market access and procurement, um, where you noticed a narrow uh, progress with uh, HR and business travel, where progress was made, but you mm. say not uh, enough. Um, the third point was a digital and cyber, also progress being made, but at a slow pace. Um, then energy access, a key area for business, uh, some progress at the local level, but challenges uh, remain. Um, intellectual property rights, uh, very uh, important laws and regulations, very big progress uh, on that field, but also um, problems for sometimes for uh, adequate uh, enforcement and uh, investment promotion and facilitation where progress was made, but uh, more ambition and specificity is uh, needed. Um, you have uh, uh, also uh, uh, noticed that uh, your members remain highly committed to uh, China, but uh, additional China investments require a strategic uh, rethink. Uh, some members start shifting investment plans, uh, and the risk is that the trend will continue. Uh, as you said in your last uh, slide, action urgently needed to, to turn the tide. So, um, Mr. Donet, uh, Mr. Brunel, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, speech. Now we have a little time for some uh, questions uh, uh, and uh, answers. Uh, I, I would uh, like to, to raise a, a first question. Um, we have uh, noticed that these uh, following the COVID, um, uh, some of the big companies uh, have uh, continued to be very active in China, uh, big European companies. We have seen that BSF uh, has announced big uh, investment uh, um, in, uh, uh, in China. But what about SMEs? Uh, do uh, SME, uh, European SMEs, uh, are they coming back to China following the end of uh, the, the COVID policy? Uh, or... Uh, are you still uh, waiting for them to return? Uh, what is the situation for the moment? Um, so uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, we have an EU SME center that we implement. It provides free services. So I, I would encourage all of your members or SMEs uh, to look at that. It's, it's a great resource um, and uh, can help them assess the China market. And I would encourage European SMEs that are thinking about going abroad to certainly consider the Chinese market, despite, again, everything that I said about the challenges, I, I China needs to be uh, considered. In terms of them coming back, I mean, I know what the inquiry level is for the center. You know, we, we keep track of the number of inquiries that we have. Um, unfortunately, it's still uh, quite low uh, post-COVID. Uh, post 
Um, we are seeing people coming back. There's been a, a few delegations. I know there was a couple of Bel Belgian delegations this year already, for example. Yeah, Spanish. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Spanish were, uh, uh, came here with, the, with their prime minister and a delegation as well. Um, uh, and I do know, I like I said at the beginning, I do know a number of SMEs here that don't have IPR issues uh, and are successful and have been successful in the market for, for, for 20 years. Um, uh, just I don't know enough of them. That's all. Um, so uh, they're not coming back in droves. They're, they're, it's trickling back. I would I, I would put it I would put it that way. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, no, I think it's the same way. Right. Um, thank you. We have a question from our treasurer Eric Famai. Uh, you have outlined uh, what action you expect from the Chinese authorities, but uh, is there anything specific that you expect from the EU uh, leadership, the EU Commission, uh, the EU leaders? It's a it's a, it's a very good question, and in the executive summary, we also give a list of recommendations to the EU as well. And first among among them is to continue to engage with China. I mean, even though we've got a number of uh, trade disputes ongoing right now, they only represent about two to three percent of overall trade. Uh, and I would say it's very important that we tackle these issues because it, it affects sentiment overall and it could it could spiral into other areas if we don't manage it. But the, the most important thing is that we continue to talk to each other. Um, and that, by and large, is still uh, still mainly happening. There are there are some areas where I think there could be better communication, uh, but there have been some some good visits on 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 both sides. Um, so that's certainly a lot better than a lot of other countries and their bilateral relationships that I've that I've seen. Um, the EU, as you all know, uh, uh, as you as I expect that you all know, but I'm not too sure if if the Chinese government knows that. If I can uh, uh, take advantage of the, of the question, my concern is the lack of knowledge in China about what's going on in the EU is is quite contained and quite limited. Um, obviously, those that focus on EU affairs at, at a government level are, are, are aware, but at the provincial level, at the municipal level, the, the, the stranger in the street, I mean, uh, they've got a million other things to think about. And so um, even though these topics are familiar to, to all of us on, on the call, I mean, I think we're preaching to the converted here. I mean, you, you guys know these issues. Um, uh, it, it's more about reaching out and being able to convince um, uh, those that are either decision makers here uh, or, or those that are able to potentially influence those the, the, those people. Um, but other, uh, and then the other thing is, yeah, and on that, I mean, the EU has got this incredible toolbox of mechanisms, investment screening and anti-subsidies and foreign uh, um, um, uh, and coercive measure, you know, rules and regulations now that um, it's it's actually in international procurement. It's starting to use them. It, it didn't just create them, but it's actually starting to use them. So um, it's a it's a it's, I think it's a learning process for the EU and for China as well. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, they don't need to be used extensively, uh, and hopefully we they can be avoided altogether uh, through negotiated solutions. But um, I think as um, uh, the former uh, European Commission uh, president said, you know, Europe will not be a, a naive trader and its market will not be taken for granted. And I think the EU is really living up to that commitment and, and, and promise right now. Um, yeah, that's and, what's happening with the uh, the import of EV cars in China, isn't it? So um, if you look at the trends, for example, of export, uh, so recently uh, a very interesting figures, so if you look at the export of, uh, of uh, batteries from China to Europe, if you look now in 2024, it's estimated that 86% of the batteries used in, in Europe will actually come from China. If you look at back, for example, just only in 2020, it was only half. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a huge, uh, huge increase, not only on the electric vehicles that are coming to, to Europe, but also on the supply chain from China to Europe. So the, the batteries. So um, I think now the European government is actually acting on that and mm -hmm. and 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 the Chinese government has tried to 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 reply, you know, uh, but this actually very little compared to what uh, to what it represents to European industries. Okay, thank you. We have a, a last question from uh, Mao Xi, who 
working for the Shenzhen representation uh, here in uh, Brussels. Um, what can uh, the Chinese city governments do to regain the confidence of the European business community? So I think you said he's from Shenzhen. So we're all yes. aware of the Greater Bay uh, Initiative, uh, and they've done a number of. Uh, they've, they've actually had a number of um, uh, policies that our members have been really have really liked uh, and enjoyed. I mean, we all know that China's. Uh, um, China's opening up, reform and opening up was all based on a gradual approach with special economic zones in certain cities having um, uh, pilots before others. I mean, Tianjin, for example, has a carbon trading mechanism pilot that's gone extremely well. And we were very um, uh, uh, encouraged uh, and recommend that that continue and be uh, expanded. Um, uh, Shanghai, Lingang and Beijing Dashing both have a green channel for, 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 for data exports that I was talking about earlier, the, the importance of being able to export uh, uh, data. So um, those areas are, are doing that. And I, I mean, these provinces and cities, they're all competing uh, against each other uh, here in China. So um, I, I would encourage them to, to strive, as I said earlier, to understand what their competitive advantage is in Shenzhen, obviously high tech innovation. So what else can you do to attract that sort of talent, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, R&D uh, um, rebates um, or, uh, I don't know, longer patent terms or I, 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 I would just really encourage each city to, to try to get approval from the central government to try something new uh, and then um, and then to resolve, try to resolve locally the issues that I've been speaking about. Um, I can I I can tell you that some governments are much local governments are much more open and receptive to dealing with business issues than others. I know Shenzhen is a leading example in China for uh, for the private sector. So in fact, I think a lot of other cities have a lot to learn from Shenzhen. So maybe you could help um, share your experiences with other cities in China for uh, attracting and creating a, uh, an innovative business environment. That that would help China. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dunnett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brunel. Uh, we are now coming to, uh, to an end of this uh, webinar. Um, I think uh, um, the action of the, the European Chamber in China is uh, very, very important, uh, very important for, for our business community, uh, where uh, um, we have uh, the chance to, to read uh, your position paper each year, but also uh, to follow uh, your activity of, uh, of lobbying, lobbying towards the Chinese authorities, but lobbying also towards the European authorities, because your voice um, is authentic. Your voice is the voice of the business people on the ground uh, in China. Um, therefore, uh, we, uh, we, we need uh, to... Uh, to read very carefully what uh, what you write and 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 can uh, find inspiration for our business um, in our day to day activities. So, thank you very very much for uh, spending time uh, with us, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to uh, also uh, invite you to join our future um, events. Uh, you have seen uh, here on the slide that we will have a webinar on 29th of October. We will have. Uh, um, we will be present at uh, uh, Flanders uh, International Trade uh, uh, Summit, uh, business summit on the 5 and 6 November. Um, on the 7th of November, uh, if you are uh, in China, we would be happy to uh, welcome you in Shanghai, uh, where we will have an event at uh, the uh, China in Import and Export Fair. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, you are uh, back uh, in Belgium on the 14th of November. We will have an event uh, around uh, Chengdu. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Thank you to our two speakers. Uh, and I hope we will have the chance to meet them back in Belgium when they pass uh, through our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes.